Welcome to the Providence College Podcast. Subscribe to the show on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and Google Play. If you like what you hear, please review and share with others. Email podcast at providence.edu with questions or comments. Go Friars! Hello and welcome to the Providence College Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Chittam, and I'm joined, as always, by PC producer and videographer Chris Judge, class of 05, here at the Providence College Podcast. It's our job to bring you interesting stories from the Friar family, and today we are happy to have Jason Macaluso, class of 96, in the house. Jason is a wealth advisor at UBS, a triathlete, a a fellow podcast host, (laughs) and a member of the Business Advisory Council here at Providence College. Jason, thanks for joining us. This is awesome. Thanks for having me, Matt. Thanks, Chris. Well, I'll tell you what, you know, I've known you for a long time. Yep. And just the list of things I just brought up, you obviously have a lot of things that you go through and your day is always packed. So I guess what what th- time does your day start and end with all of these <laughs> things? Never mind the fact that you're a, you know, a dad and yep. a husband as well. Yep. So I'm a, uh, a husband of 17 years. I have a, we have a 10-year-old daughter. Um, so my day starts anywhere around four, four thirty AM and that's only because I have to get my training in, um, because I'm also a triathlete. So uh yeah, my day starts then it, it ends pretty much around ten o'clock PM if I keep my eyes open that long. But yeah. <laughs> so an, an early start, that's for sure. And I can't wait Definitely. to talk to you about yep. the triathlete yeah. piece. Um before we get into that though. As I mentioned, you are a wealth advisor at UBS, yep. Yep. and that's part of the reason that you're on the Business Advisory mm-hmm. Council here at PC. So I guess, first of all, what is a wealth advisor? What does that even mean? Sure. So um, basically, we are um, uh, the old school uh, way of saying is I'm a stockbroker. So that's what I was when I got into the business 17 years ago. Um, and so basically, I'm a financial advisor with UBS, and I have my own team there. It's Boone Macaluso Partners, and it's me, myself, and my business partner, Andy Boone, and we're both financial advisors at UBS. So what that means is we're, we have all the licenses to, um, to, to sell stocks and bonds and mutual funds and any type of securities license you need in the industry. But primarily what we do is we, we manage the wealth of, of um, a select group of clients their families, and um, we do everything from financial planning to stock, not stock picking, but um, portfolio management. We do um, anything that involves numbers, we, we work we work with them on. Right. So. so is this something that you always wanted to do? So going back to, say, yeah. your PC days, was that always part of the... Part of the plan is why you came to PC and what you're hoping to get out of it? Sure, it's a great question. So um, when I graduated from PC in 96, I had a, or I have a finance degree, and I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do with it. Um, I, I actually started at PC as an, as an economics major and took my first econ class and decided that was not the road I wanted to go down. It was too analytical for me. Um, so then I took an accounting class and also very analytical. Um, but I started taking finance. I was really interested in the markets and how the markets worked. And, um, I was actually inspired by the movie wall street, the original one with, uh, with Charlie Sheen and, and, um, my, um, Michael Douglas. And, um, I liked the side of the business that involved the markets and the fast paced, um, side of it and managing money and talking to people with money and, and the highs and lows and the excitement that came about doing it. So, um, but I had no clue what that meant. Right. No clue. <laughs> I didn't have any internships. Um, I, there, there was no business school where we're sitting now. There was nothing like that when I was here. So I was kind of just basing it off of a movie that I saw. Right. Right. So so as you went through your major, obviously, certain things start to crystallize. Mm-hmm. And at what point did you did you move from, okay, this is something that I potentially mm-hmm. want to do or I'm exploring to, all right, this is definitely something that I want to pursue post-college and you kind of move into your you know, job hunt yep. with that in mind? Yeah, that's a great question. So I uh, graduated in 96 and um, jobs were plentiful. Uh, I mean, I could have, there was many jobs to be had. They were just, there was offers from everywhere. That was during the very booming economic time. Um, and I actually interviewed for uh, the same position I'm in now, but it was at Dean Witter and which is now Morgan Stanley, which is now, actually now Smith Barney. And, um, I remember sitting with an advisor who was a little older than me and I walked in and he basically said, so this is a commission job. You're getting no salary and you have to live and breathe this job 24 seven for the next five years or you will 
fail. And I said, this is not for me. And um, I ended the interview um, and I went to work in a bank for two years because the, that I, I liked the finance part of it, but there was no way I could get in front of people uh, th- that I could build a business not knowing people with money. So when you heard that, like, well, obviously you made a, 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 a change or a kind of a shift away from that that kind of job but yeah. what was going through your mind when you heard that or your gut when you're like oh geez like this is not for me like how did yeah. how did that feel or what was that what was that like i was scared i mean all my all my roommates all my friends around me they were you know working they were getting jobs at ibm and putnam and state street and all you know big big accounting firms and they were making a salary you know with with vacation days and benefits and um the fact that i had to be in a hundred percent commission-based job was not for me. So, but I liked the finance side of it. So I went to work for a bank for about a year. And that's when I started getting the itch of, you know, I I really love this side of the business, but um, I was in a branch, a local, small local branch. Um, Actually, Chris was in Milford. We're speaking, Chris and I are both from Milford. Um, And uh I liked talking to people. I liked meeting with people. I liked talking about their finances, their money, and getting to know them on a very personal level. <clears throat> but I said, you know, the, the bank was not for me. I wanted to be back into a, a bigger brokerage firm. So I went and re-interviewed at Dean Witter and actually Prudential Securities, um, another major firm at the time, which is no longer, <laughs> and um, both in New Haven. And Prudential offered me uh, the job. Um, but it was the same thing. It was 100% commission. Right. Um, it was just two years later. So at that point, and yeah. we're it's in the new PCSB building, mm-hmm. uh, which you mentioned earlier, the Art and Patricia Ryan uh, School of Business here on campus. And we just opened about a month ago uh, from the time we're recording this on February 14th. And so if you hear people walking by, we're in the <laughs> third floor conference room of what used to be Door Hall. Yep. And we'll get into the ins and outs of the building. But uh, if you hear people in the background, that's what that is. And... So you obviously, you go back to the same job that you originally, yep. you know, said no, because I was scared no, so, of. Yep. Right. So what shifted besides the fact that you had a better idea of what you wanted in life yep. from the minute you took that job, yep. how did you approach it in a way to kind of alleviate some of your own budgetary issues or, yeah. <laughs> you know, that whole like, eat what you kill model? Yeah. You know, how do you kind of start the process yeah. and then finish it off? So, I mean, please correct me if I'm wrong. I'm throwing a lot at you here. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's also a very high turnover yeah. type position. Yeah. So um, let me just, we'll go back a second. So I think the the year and a half to two years at the bank, I realized I didn't want to work for someone. I didn't want to be stuck in a position where I had to report to uh, a management hierarchy, for lack of a better word. And I wanted to be my own boss. And I guess the, you call it now, I want to be an entrepreneur, but the entrepreneurs didn't really exist back then. Um so um, I knew the only way to do that is if I took a job that was 100% commission and no one was going to tell me what I can or can, cannot do. Within reason, obviously, there's compliance right. issues. But So um, I basically, they, uh, the, the, the job at Prudential was you have to, to your, use your words exactly, eat what you kill. And the training program was um, they sent 300 of us down to Manhattan Um Actually, ironically, it was, you know, at the time, I think Art Ryan was CEO of Prudential Securities or a C-level executive at the time. So um, there was 300 of us in a boardroom and the training program was um, 300 to 500 cold calls every single day for three weeks. So Monday through Friday, um, we just pick up the phone and dial in this huge boardroom, um, come back on Saturday so and, who, who do you call? Yeah, so there was there were just names. There was a lead list of names of people with phone numbers, and we were being trained how to talk to people on the phone, and and more importantly, how to have how to take rejection, and and how to have people say no to us, and then move on to the next person. And the training program was literally a huge boardroom, and these trainers would just listen to us talk, and they'd put us on speakerphone, and they'd critique us. And they would stand over our shoulder and they would just constantly help us to sell. So if you're there for 10 hours, yep. you make 500 calls, mm-hmm. you're making basically making one call a minute. Yeah. Okay. So how long, I guess, so obviously this must be, you must have been exhausted, first of all, going yeah. through that. But at what point, I guess, what's the ratio of quick no's to mm-hmm. actually engaging with 
someone on the other line in a cold call situation like that. Sure, sure. So it was just a numbers game. It was just you dial as many as you can. So you if you made 300 dials, you got 100 people to actually pick up the phone. And 90, 90 of them told you to go pound sand. And 10 of them were halfway interested. And of those 10, one person would want some sort of information or follow-up call. So every day, your goal was to come back, to come out of that with one lead. Um, so, but it was a numbers game. You had to make 300 dials to get one lead. And that's not, a, that's not an account. That's a lead. That's a, right. a, a qualified person living, breathing that might have money to invest. With so you. you're saying this is a training program. So what did you yeah. learn from that experience? Uh, how to take rejection and how to have people tell you to go pound sand and some other choice words over the phone. But right. more importantly, how to talk to people, how to, how to have a conversation with people. The, the point of it was you were going to get rejected 99% of the time. So you had to build up your rapport, build up your confidence. I mean, we were all 25 years old. We had no idea what we were doing. And, you know, they didn't even teach us how to invest money because the point was, is we had to get clients, right? If we, we had no clients, right? So you could have been the best stock picker in the room, but if you had no clients, you would fail. And to your question before, part of your question before was the failure rate. So after that training program, we'd go, all go back to our respective branches. And mine was in New Haven, still is in New Haven, Connecticut. And um, I did the same thing. I came in every morning at seven o'clock. And I'd make 300 dials till about four o'clock and I'd leave and I'd go to the gym or go grab some dinner and I'd come back at six o'clock and dial again till nine o'clock. And I'd do that five days a week and I'd come back Saturday morning and dial from eight in the morning till noon and I'd take Sunday off because I think I deserved it. <laughs> and I'd come back in on Monday and do it again. And I did that for five solid years. I have to ask. Why? Why did you? Yeah. This doesn't sound like the most enjoyable profession. So why stick with something like that for five years yeah. is a long time yep. to stick with the job. So, I, what? So what? So we we've gone through like the hard kind of like you know from an abstract view yep. why this is a difficult job yep. and why a lot of people can get churned through it. Yeah, and let me just stop you right there for a second because so I went back to the training program six months later and half the class was gone. So out of the 300 people, there's 150 people after six months. And then six months after that, there was like 10 of us left. Wow. That's amazing. So why stick with it? Right. That's a great question. Because I knew the end result, because I looked around the office and saw other financial advisors, other wealth advisors, and these were men and women who were successful and, and monetarily successful, but more importantly, they were not answering to anybody. They were able to build their practice they want, they want, the way they wanted to build it. They were able to work with people they wanted to work with. There was guys in that office at the time um, that just worked with athletes. So they managed the money of athletes. That I could drop names now and they were managing their money. Or there was another uh, team that was managing the wealth of actors and actresses. Oh, wow. um, so you, you could choose the path that you wanted to go down and nobody was stopping them. And you had this complete, um, autonomy to do whatever you wanted to do, work, whoever you wanted to work with and make your own hours. You know, right. these guys were, once you established yourself, once you built a practice of clients that wanted to work with you and and instead of making 300 dials you were actually getting referrals coming in and having people that wanted to work with you because you were building a name for yourself um you know these were these are people that were coming in at you know, nine o'clock and not and i shouldn't say they were sleeping until eight and coming at nine but they right. were basically they were not a slave to a clock they were not working eight to five they were are and still are were, were and still are working 24 7 we never stopped working but right there was no manager saying, hey, how come you're not in at 8.30? And, and 5 o'clock, they were punching a clock to get out of there. Right, especially now you know, where you can do work from anywhere yep. from your phone. Yeah. You know, I, I can see how that would be a nice thing. So so being in a facility where you can kind of see the personification of your goal, like mm-hmm. walking down the hallway or in the office next yep. to you, that obviously played a huge role in kind of, you know, forming the kind of the grit necessary to stick with the yep. hard times. So at what point does it shift from – you know, just plowing through yep. what you're going through is early on in your career. Can you identify the point where it shifted for you from being, all right, kind of novice, new, yep. trying to get your foot in the door to, hey, I can see that I've, you know, kind of 
eclipsed this certain level where I'm mm-hmm. now on a new plane or a new tier? Yeah, I think it's 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 five years. I don't know what that five year mark is, and I think it's the same in any successful business. Um, you know, the, the the front end is usually a lot of grinding, a lot of failure, a lot of why am I doing this, and then all you see these little bits and pieces of some light coming in and you know there's some little things happening and then the little things start compounding on themselves and become bigger things and then for me it was a, it, it was easy to look at from a mo- monetary perspective because i was making no money literally making no money for the first three years mm-hmm. um you know friends of old friar roommates of mine were making real money real salaries real vacation i had no vacation days uh, the, nobody was paying me to stay home because I was sick. So it wasn't until that five year shift where I was making more than my friends were making and then exceeding, um, exceeding them. And, and I think it was that five year shift. And I don't know what the five year shift. It wasn't one account. It wasn't anything but just the uh, accumulation of all that hard work. Right. So you come back and you talk to students on occasion mm-hmm. here. Um, another way of saying this is if you could, you know, talk to your 25 year old self and yep. give advice, what would you say is to something that, you know, that would, you know, help somebody who's in that situation just starting out? Yeah. Um, so it's, it was impossible to get into this profession 17 years ago and now it's next to impossible to get into it. It's just, it just gets, it was hard then. And it's, it's, it's even harder now for a lot of reasons. You cannot make cold calls anymore do not call list um, prevents that. Um, you know, at the time this was right before the internet boom. So, you know, people needed our advice, you know, in person, verbally, they couldn't get it online. You couldn't pick up your phone and, and punch in a stock ticker or get research reports. So they really needed us. Um, but the thing that hasn't changed is it's, it's a, it's a profession that deals primarily with people. Mm-hmm. Okay. People, you know, we manage the wealth, of about 150 families and they trust us with their wealth. I mean, this is, we know everything about them. I say we, we know more than that their doctor because we know their health issues. We know their, their marital issues, pros and cons. We know all about their kids, their grandkids. Um, we know about their job. We know what stresses them out and um, money is the biggest stress in the world. And that's what we deal with. So it's, it's a people profession. It was then it was 17 years ago and it still is. I think it's even more so now. Right. Um, so to your question of what do we, what do, what do I tell students when I come back here or, or when I take a call from a, from a PC student that wants to do what I do is um, just say yes to anything as far as getting your foot in the door. I think the thing now is you can't do this on your own. You cannot do my profession on your own. You, you cannot be a sole practitioner. You know, I came into this business. It was just myself. Um, I was fortunate that I, I survived for a couple of years and then joined the team. I was actually joined a team about five years into my profession. Um, so it was, there was, there were strength in numbers, but, and that I left that team to form my own team. Um, but we, you know, right now, I think if any student is listening to this that wants to get into the profession, it's just do whatever you can to get your foot in the door. Um, you're not going to be hired to make 500 cold calls, but you might be hired to, you know, do research reports or, or just, you know, uh, be on a sales desk, um, work in a bank. I think working in a bank branch, anything you could do to get in front of people mm-hmm. and talk to people and build a comfort level talking to people is what you need to do. Because if you can't talk to people, then you shouldn't be in this profession. You shouldn't be in a lot of professions. Right. And from a communication standpoint, mm-hmm. you talked about your new start. It was kind of before the internet boom. Yep. Right. And here we are, right? We're 20 years later. And the way people communicate changes all the time. Yeah. It's a drastic communication from drastic change from when you started. Yep. So how does, you know, I don't even want to say social media because it's mm-hmm. just the age of, it's just what the internet is now. Right. How does those tools, social media tools now and in the future, how does that affect how you communicate with, you know, with your clients? It's a great question because yeah, when I did it, it was literally picking up a phone and making dials. And I know we joked about this. I cold called out of the PC alumni book <laughs> and it was an actual book. It was actual hard pages and I cold called PC alum. Um, with a phone. Um, but now it's, it's completely different. So, you know, uh, we, there's a lot more, there's a lot less 
face-to-face meetings with our clients. I mean, at the end of the day, people still want to be in front of each other, but that's rare that, you know, we, we meet with our clients four times a year. Every client of ours gets a, a you know, a, a quarterly conversation. 99% of the time, it's done over the phone because people are so busy. They don't want to drive into our office. You know, a lot of our clients are all over the United States, but they're so comfortable talking on the phone right now. Right. You know, that's just how communication is, is done. Out, right. So, so there's a lot of our meetings are done over the phone. Um, you know, all my clients have my cell phone number. So I get that Sunday night text, you know, about anything. Um, so there's always constant communication that way. Um, we do a monthly email to all of our clients, which, you know, it's funny. I think email is kind of dead, you know, uh, uh, do they even read it? I doubt it, but it, it is relevant information. So what we've done is we actually have tried to stay ahead of the curve on what we think is the next platform. And, um, so we wanted we, basically our clients, so the, let me backtrack a second. The demographic of our clients, myself and Andy's clients are that 35 to 55 year old earner, right? So we have a lot of clients that are in their prime earning years. They are, you know, retirement is probably a little far off with, you know, five years out, although we have some younger clients that are retiring pretty young. Um, but so they are constantly being bombarded with stuff. So the last thing they want to do is get an email blast from us that they're going right. to read. So we wanted to, how, how do people want to listen or be communicated with? And it's on their own time. Mm-hmm. which is why we're sitting here, right? You are doing a podcast because now people can listen to this when they want to. Uh, as I was driving up here, uh, I was listening to a couple podcasts, right? It's on our own time. So myself and Andy set our own podcast. And we did this because we want to communicate with not only our clients, but more importantly, um, with potential clients. Mm-hmm. And our firm, so UBS has a daily podcast, where they actually um, every morning it comes out and they they um, uh, disseminate relevant market information. The problem is it's that information is probably outdated within an hour, right? right? <laughs> so Andy and I wanted to do something this similar, but knew we couldn't do a market related. So we kind of turned it around and did a podcast on you know what do people want to listen to? And one of the things that we found is that. We are in a great position with our careers to talk to some awesome people. We've right. met some amazing people, and I don't know if this is the road you're going down, but um, no, I mean you, the list of your list of uh, podcast uh, guests are fantastic. You know, we have the, the list of seven here. Um, I love the description of Matthew Polly. I loved it. as soon as you put that one out. I was yeah. like, oh boy, yes. we got to see if we can get him on the podcast. He has, uh, I'm quoting here. Hear how a Rhodes Scholar from Princeton trained with Shaolin monks, stepped into an MMA fight, and lived to write two books about it. Like, yeah. It was, so, that's, that's, that's awesome. But that's the cool thing about all those people on there. So these are all people that Andy and I have, have you know, our paths have crossed at some point in our careers. And where this came about was we left these meetings and we said, holy crap, if we had just recorded that conversation, you know, Four people would probably want would be interested in listening to it. Right. So we went to our firm, to UBS, and said, "Hey, you know, Andy and I want to do this podcast where we have these con- we call it conversations with unconventional thinkers and doers." And this is, you know, it people that we come across that, and it's not market related. So, um, the firm allows us to do it. We are one of only two people in the entire firm of seven thousand advisors that do this. It's on our UBS website. And um, we basically went back to all these people that we know and said, hey, we want to just tell us your story. Right. So, so, so Matthew Polly was great. So Matt, so, so Andy, my partner, um, is a pen grad. So he's very smart. And Matt Polly. You're a PC grad, yeah. Jason. You're very smart, <laughs> right. too. I'm smart. He's smarter. <laughs> um, so Matt is a Rhodes Scholar. And um, he comes from a very... Um, conservative um, family. His, his dad is a surgeon, and he graduates from, I want to say, Dartmouth or Princeton. Yeah it, says, yeah, it says Princeton right here. Thank you, Princeton. And it was an Ivy League. And he goes, you know what? I'm going to go and train with the Shaolin monks for two years and become, and, and then learn how to become an MMA fighter. And that conversation was awesome. And that's probably one of the one of the most well liked podcasts that we have. But then you look at another one is we have Joe Capabianco who is a tattoo artist. So right. not a Rhodes Scholar, 
um, you know, has a, you know, uh, but has a thriving practice in the New Haven area, has a reality show. Right. Fascinating guy. Totally yeah. fascinating. That, you know, that's another one of my, I mean, they're all my favorites. Uh, it's like asking which kid you like the best. They're all different in their own right. But these are the types of people that Andy and I get to talk to every single day. So do you see, so, so people who are starting now in your, in your role, as they progress, could you see an era, even if they might even be today for all I know, is that they're using, like, say, in, you know, Instagram, mm-hmm. DMs, Snapchat to kind of either form relationships with people and or cultivate relationships that they've already had? Do you, do you see do you see that era coming or do you see um, kind of a line between that sort of informal social media yeah. presence versus more formalized presence? Yeah, I think that that it, that, that time is now. Um you know, the problem that Andy and I have to deal with is, I shouldn't say it's a problem. We are in a very highly compliant industry, as right. we should be. We, we, we manage the wealth of, of, individual, of individuals, and there's a lot of stuff that could go wrong, right? So it's very compliant. Um, but at the same time, it's all about building relationships. So we walk that fine line between how we meet people um, you know, in person, but more importantly, how do we broaden our, our horizon? So we are out there on social media on a personal level because we're real people. So, you know, it's out there. I've met a lot of people through social media that just, an, you know, an instant connection, whether it's right. through triathlon or through PC or through other, some, com- some other common social media connection. And then from there, then you build a relationship. Right. But so I think that time is now. Um, and I think the industry, unfortunately, is a little behind in it, um, although they're getting better. But I understand why they have to be the, the, the way that they are. No, you bring a good point with the, with the whole compliance issue, um, especially with like Snapchat, where you're like deleting posts right, and things exactly. like that. Um, and th- like you just mentioned, I, I, you're on Instagram. You know, for you, you and your brand, they're one of the same. Yep. So, you know, you don't have like the UBS you know, Instagram account. No, in fact, I can't. Macaluso I, I, Instagram account. I can't. That's one of the things we can't do is, you know, so UBS has its own rules. So we have a UBS website. Right. It's, it's my UBS team website. And our podcasts are on our UBS website. And I have a LinkedIn account through UBS. But everything else I do on social media is my own personal accounts. And I can't put anything on there that's UBS content. Right. The, the two shall never cross. <laughs> it's like church and state. <laughs> so, so, I, you know, so I know we're, we're friends on Instagram. Yep. Um, you know, we've known each other for a long time. And you know, I love following you because for you, for me, you're like fitness motivation yep. on top of everything else that you do. So I have to ask, first of all. Just for the background for anyone's listening, obviously, first of all, what are some of your accomplishments in triathlon uh, and how did it start for you? Because it's sure. not like as if you were a college athlete no. here at PC. No, no, no. So, so, so none of the above. So I was, um, uh, I was a high school swimmer. So that was 88 through 92. That's four years. Right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I was okay. I was at a state, I was good enough to swim at a state level. Um, I ran cross country. I wasn't good at cross country. I did some track, but I was a good swimmer. Uh, I was good. I wasn't good enough to swim at PC or any other division one school, but I was a good swimmer. Um, in college, never did any, uh, formal sports, obviously did intramurals, but that was it. And, um, but always ran and and swam, you know, so, um, graduate from PC, start working and the opposite. I stopped working out, you know, I would, or I would nothing formal. I just was in, and I was, uh, gaining weight and becoming out of shape. You're and sitting behind a desk all day on totally. the phone. On yeah. the phone, right? You know, so it was just, it was not going on a path I wanted to go down. So um, long story short is, so my wife, yeah, we were married at the time. Um, she, we had no children or no child and she was um, working in biotech. And at the time biotech was collapsing and her firm was about a year from going under. So she wanted to go to law school. So she, we couldn't afford for her to stop working. So she went to law school part-time at nights. Now I had nothing to do. So I started, I started running again. And then I started swimming a little bit. And then I started hanging out with some triathletes and they're like, hey, you should do a, triath- uh, a triathlon. And so I bought a bike. And so it kind of came about because I, I had two choices when she was at law school. I could either not do anything and, and continue to go down a path of 
a bad path or do something uh, going back to my roots of, of endurance sports. So um, I'm like, hey, I swam in, in high school. I could swim. So I got in the pool and almost drowned. Um, but <laughs> like everything I've done in my life, I put 110% effort into it and I wasn't going to fail. Um, but triathlon is yeah. a not just a physically demanding sport. It's very time intensive. Yes. Because you basically have to be as good as you can be in three different disciplines. Yep. So it's not that it takes three times the amount of time because there's some crossover in mm-hmm. terms of building an aerobic base and whether yep. in, in any of these endeavors. But, you know, it's not like you were, you know, working part time right. getting started with this. Yeah. So um, was it just like a gradual shift in the amount of time you were spending in triathlon or did you just get hooked and all of a sudden you're like, all right, I'm going full bore into this? Yeah, I don't do anything gradually. I'm all or nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm true fryer colors. I'm black or white. So there's no gray. Um, I, I tell you exactly what it was. I was, so I, I was trying to build my practice and I was playing golf and I hated golf. No offense to any golfers out there. And I was on the golf course and I'm sitting there and it's a beautiful day. And a bunch of guys come flying by the course on their tri bikes. And I'm like, Oh my God, that's what I want to be right now. And I decided that day I'm going to figure out a way to combine my love of triathlon with my business and build a practice around people I want to be with because I don't want to work. I didn't want to work with the golfers I was playing with because I was talking about his golf. I want to be with a group of guys doing triathlons. So I actually, and this is the, the thing with any entrepreneur, you have to figure out how to balance it, but it all has to kind of work together. I said, I'm going to figure out a way to build triathlon and business together. So I started doing more research and I found out that the triathlon community has the highest per capita income of any sport out there. Just is, is it because you've already decided this way. That's just a fluky. Stat. It was like a fluke. It was, thank God it wasn't fly fishing. <laughs> and the reason being is, is a couple fold. So one, you have to be a type A personality because you need to figure out, as Matt points to Chris, you need to figure out how to spend, how to fit two to three hours of training a day into your already crazy schedule. Right. You need to have disposable income because the races are expensive. The Chris and I were just talking about our travels to Disney to do some races. You have to travel for a lot of these sports. The bikes. My, are- I won't even tell you how much my bike costs because my <laughs> wife would kill me. Um, pl- and, and, and you, you have to have time and, um, and the personality to do it. So that bodes well with successful um, um, uh, people in business, successful business owners or successful in business that have time. They're usually C-level executives. Um, they have disposable income. Right. And you're not picking this up on a Sunday. You're not, again, not no offense to golf. You're not hacking up a golf course for six hours on a Monday afternoon in a golf tournament. Right. And you're not hopping on a four hour ride just for the fun of it. No. Like you can go play golf and it'd be enjoyable and you shoot 120. Who cares? Exactly. You're drinking some beers. This right. is, you're going out there for a purpose. Um, so I saw, kind of saw this happening. And, um, so I actually, I built a LinkedIn group. I don't know if you know this. Yeah. I have a LinkedIn triathlete group. It's called triathlete business network. I I'm not a triathlete, so I couldn't, I couldn't post. Uh, I'll, try let, to get I'll in. let you in. <laughs> um, it has 5,200 members in it. Oh, wow. Yeah. And these are people all over the world. And I've met a handful of them, talked to a handful of them, but these are C-level executives. These are business owners. These are entrepreneurs um you know there's silicon valley is exploding with these startup triathlon companies um strava and other apps that are being built out on uh, on on rides mm-hmm. you, you know it's basically there's a great article in the times that said you know people are not playing golf anymore triathlon is a new golf and and if you can't hang with some of these guys on a bike ride they don't want to talk business with you oh how so interesting a lot of our clients are triathletes um, I've met so many people through this community and um, they all, they're all our perfect client and they're people we love working with. So it's, it's funny as like you, as you, if we kind of go talk about the various aspects of your life from college on, it seems like one common thread here is just from a self-awareness standpoint, like knowing what you wanted to do yep. and the kind of person you wanted to be and the kind of people you wanted to be, you know, affiliated yes. with either from a personal level or professional level. Yep. Now that kind of self-awareness, is that something that you kind of always had or did you grow you kind of that, were you kind of mentored on that or uh, how did that get fostered? Wow. We're getting philosophical. Um, I have no idea, Matt. I, I think I'm, I'm all about 
balance and life is life's too short i know it's so cliche and and nothing bad ever happened in my life where i think this way but i want to surround myself with good people um i i think this business has hardened me over the past 17 years Mm -hmm. um and i met some really not nice people so i want to focus on the good people right and and i think by putting myself out there with people i want to be with um that's important to myself and andy um you know that that is and i don't know where that came from i think it's just my upbringing from my parents and the fact that i was brought up in a great home and and i was always surrounded by goodness um i wanted to continue that and and i I never took the. I wanted to take the moral the moral road down whatever I the path or whatever I did, and, and and I wanted it to be positive. So right. I was listening to the the Rich Roll podcast mm-hmm. yesterday with Mark Allen. Listen to the way up there. And Mark Allen is the the greatest uh, endurance athlete of all time, the yeah. best triathlete of all time, uh, six time winner of the uh, the Ironman World Championships yep. at Kona, ten time winner of the Nice Triathlon over in France, um, and his his path. To like basically the, the top echelon of triathlon, which is funny now because he still to this day has the best marathon split yeah. ever yep. in Kona. Yep. If you adjust for the fact that his marathon split counted his transition time, yes. where the yep. current transition time is not included, he ran two forty in the marathon in hundred degree weather yep. after, after running <laughs> after riding one hundred seventeen miles yeah. and, and swimming what two point six. So. You see, you, you listen to that, and it's so funny how you see all these technological advancements, right? right? You, you talk about, hey, you know, your bike obviously is teched out. Yep. That's why it costs whatever it costs, and you have all these metrics you can you can have stats on, whether it's heartbeat and you know all these other yep. things. And it's funny you have this guy who was there at the beginning of triathlon. Yeah. You know, like his first Ironman, there was like two hundred people on an aluminum bike, right? With the goos didn't exist and. Powerade didn't exist. Oh yeah, yeah. People were like smushing up bananas exactly. and throwing it like and then yeah. throwing it like into their into their pack for yeah, the bike. Exactly. Yet, that he's at, at the top level. Yep. And he talked about how the balance between the physical and the mental yeah. for him that was the that was the transition point between you know being very good and reaching another level. Yeah. Now, have you seen that sort of thing in your in your endeavor? I know you're very you're, you're a techie guy. You're very up to date with a lot of stuff. But have you seen similar? a similar piece where if you can tap into that, that has a positive benefit, not only, you know, athletically, but professionally as well. Yeah. I think, I think mentally you, you, you need to, to be in a different place than everybody else. You know, people always ask me, you know, why do you get up so early? Why do you do what you do? It's because I enjoy it. I enjoy being in my own mind and just pushing my body, but more importantly, my mind of where it could go. You know, your, your, your mind is so powerful and, that tends to check out, right, you know, pretty quick. But it can push through a lot of these things. And, and Mark Allen's a great example. I mean, he was doing on, on stuff now that if guys rode what he was riding then, they would they would fail miserably. Right. Um, you, you know, he had that pot, he had blood blisters on his feet, and he still finished and came in first because the mind is just so powerful. That, I mean, I don't know, that's what got me through 300 cold calls every day, is just putting yourself in a different place, um that's why i love yoga that's why i love just um just being just being right know? and we mentioned before you're on the business advisory council yeah. here at pc uh we're gonna be finishing up in a little bit and thank you so much for joining yeah. us and well, with everything you're doing why is that something that you wanted to be a part of and how has that you know been for you as an experience great yeah so um like i said before i'm an all or nothing guy so if i'm going to commit to something i'm going to commit 110 percent into it um and so i Love. I loved my four years at PC, um, but I think I'm getting more out of it now than I did then. And just the people I met in, you know, after my graduation 20 years ago um, have been amazing. So when I met Dr. Maxfield, um, Dr. Sylvia Maxfield, and this is two or three years ago. In fact, you introduced me to her, Matt. Um, you know, I'm like, this is a woman that's building some amazing stuff over here. And I want to be part of it. And and I think my way of giving back is, you know, they're not going to put the Macaluso wing on this building. But what let's I... Not, let's, <laughs> let's not go there yet, Jason. you got a long career ahead of you. <laughs> but, but what I could do is give back in different ways. And I want to be involved. And I want to help in any way I can. And right. I think a lot of that is not monetarily. I think that's how people give back uh, and make a more positive impact is by doing stuff that, you know, resource-wise and, and talking to students and 
you know, uh, so I wanted to do that. And I think the afternoon I'm getting through the BAC is, is pretty amazing. I'm having a good time doing it. Oh, that's fantastic. And we're, we're glad you're part of it. And I think that this building is a testament to a lot of the people who have been involved, not only directly with the business school, but around campus uh, generally. Yeah, so definitely. We're glad you're here. We're so glad you made it up here. That's great. Um, good luck with everything. Thank and you. Uh, thank you for being a friar. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And one last thing before you go, if you're interested in reaching out to Jason or contacting him in any way, he can be reached at ubs.com forward slash team forward slash Boone Macaluso. That's spelled B-O-O-N-E-M-A-C-A-L-U-S-O. Thank you and go Friars.